trading futures and options on futures involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all traders and investors. Oftentimes in futures trading, you have a high combination of leverage and volatility. And although this could be an equation for opportunity, it's also an equation for risk. So be careful. Only fund your futures trading account with risk capital. My personal definition of risk capital is money I could afford to lose doesn't change my lifestyle or overly stress me out. As human beings, we make bad decisions when we're under stress, so be in a good spot. Remember, micro contracts could be friends. Take it easy on the day trade margins. You get plenty of leverage without maxing out on those day trade margins on a regular basis. We'll be taking a look at a real-time simulated live Ninja Trader trading platform today, and none of this should be construed as trade or investment advice. Past performance not indicative of future. Good afternoon. No, it's still morning. I'm sorry. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to see the futures today, August 2nd, Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. Hump day, everybody. Today, we have a very special guest with us that I'm going to introduce in a second. And we got a great topic to talk about as well. So I appreciate everybody being here uh, today. And my guest today, we've seen him once here before, and hopefully we'll see him many times here in the future is Dan Gramza, Gramza Capital Management. Dan, good morning. Good morning, Jim. Great to be with you. I'm, I'm glad you are here. You're looking dapper. You're looking good. Everything well? <laughs> All is good. Thank you. All right. Well, you're so Dan, for everybody who doesn't know Dan, I'll do a real, real brief inter introduction. Dan's been involved in the futures markets for, I'm going to say, decades. Is that about right? Yeah. Yeah, amazingly. Yeah, time flies by. Yeah, I mean, I was, I mean, at one point I was young, a long time ago. <laughs> and, you know, I was introduced to you early and it was, you You know, you, you were already uh, high level teaching some of the stuff uh, for traders, which was very impressive. Oh, uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, now, Dan, you've spent a lot of your career, though, um, traveling around the world, a lot of your career consulting with 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 large banks throughout the world my guess is you've been to japan before yes okay so and i've never been there so i just wish i i would love to go there but you know japan what people sometimes forget is that they're not they're one of the from a gdp point of view they're one of the largest countries in the world that, that's right it, and i hope you do have a chance to visit there it's an amazing place uh, but yes, it's the third largest GDP, about $4.9 trillion. It, it's a unique place in the world. Uh, and there there are some challenges there uh, coming up. We've seen some comments last week from the Bank of Japan that really kind of set the tone. And it, there's a lot of things, I think, as we go forward, Jim, that you and I kind of want to monitor uh, and follow. Uh, because because of where Japan fits in to the global perspective. And uh, I think there's some things that you and I should be sensitive to. Well, so before we get into that, those sensitive stuff, let's, let's kind of set the table here. So the Bank of Japan is the central bank in Japan, and they have a similar system to the FOMC, right? They have a governor, a deputy, and then I, I think it was six other uh, directors. Correct. So from, from a structural point of view, they're appointed by the government. And yep. so by drawing parallels, pretty similar to what we do here in the U.S. It is. It is. That's right. They set policy and it impacts everything, just like our Federal Reserve does here. Uh, I, I don't think people sometimes appreciate the impact when we hear statements or changes by the Fed here. It affects everything. The cost of business, the amount of money available, all these other issues that affect our daily lives. Now, it takes a while. That's, I think, Jim, that's one thing when a, when a central bank makes a decision. The market, as you know, reacts instantly. We see a response. But the economy of the country, you know, it takes six months to 18 months for the economy to absorb those changes. That's what happens here in the United States. And it's also why, you know, the markets are saying, please, Fed, look, at, we're seeing some changes here. Let's leave interest rate increases alone that, because they're afraid of a recession. And if 
are interest rates at a level where it could cause a recession? Who knows? Fed doesn't know, but that is a concern. And that issue, well, it's the same in Japan. They're sensitive to that as well. And it takes a while when they make a statement, not for the market to respond, but for the economy to respond. Okay, so I'm going to sidetrack a little bit because there's two kinds of statements, right? So last last week we had their official report. And, uh, you know, after their last central bank meeting, their monetary policy meeting, and we expect the minutes of that meeting, you know, again, those, those are also four to six weeks in the future. Um, but uh, and same thing here in the U.S. But in the U.S., we have we have the FOMC members, you know, today, Bosnick running around saying stuff, Goolsby running around saying stuff. Do you still have that kind of freedom in Japan where their board of governors just kind of makes general comments after the meeting? No, my experience with them is they do what I wish we would do in many ways. They they told the line. They followed the script. The, the challenge that we have here, uh, and I guess there are pros and cons to it, but when people are out there saying something, it sets a tone. You know, th- th- these People from the Fed, when they make comments, the market listens. So what are they saying? We're not going to have any more increases. We are going to have more increases. Or yes, they're very aggressive. We're not done with inflation. We got to do more changes. Or they say, no, we should back off. It becomes confusing. And we see it reflected in the marketplace. To me, if, if this is the position of the Federal Reserve, we should march to the beat of that drum. And that's kind of what you see in Japan. That's been my experience. They they follow. So you have a consistent message, I would say. And I think that's important because then the market and the economy can rely on that, right? When they say something, that's what it means. We're here, they say something, but is that what it means? So maybe stable markets equals stable expectations. Ooh, that's a good one, Jim. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> I think you're on target there. So, all right. So let's talk about inflation, though, because you know, we what what's the situ- what's the inflationary situation in Japan versus versus the U.S., Great Britain, the eurozone? It se- they seem to have a different track going. Well, it, you need to look at the history. In a sense, I mean, they want 2% inflation, right? That That's their objective. Now they're above that. And, but if you, if you go back to the late 80s, you know, Japan, the world felt Japan was going to buy everything. You know, their economy was incredibly strong. They are buying farmland, in the United States. Uh, they were, they bought Pebble Beach, you know, they, People said, geez, you should learn Japanese because they really are going to dominate and we should respect that and get ready for that. Well, then they had an asset issue and in the 1990s, things dramatically changed. I remember being in an office building in Tokyo, uh, actually it was Bank of America, looking down at the U.S. Embassy and they had a tennis court there. Uh, and I remember the person I was with, Kunosan, mentioning to me that the value of the real estate of that tennis court, I can't remember how many multiple millions it was in that part of Tokyo, which was, I can't remember it because it was beyond belief. Anyways, things changed. So what did they do? They took a conservative approach. You know, the United States has done that too. You know, we went to 0% interest rates because we said, why does why does the country do that? They do it because they want to make money available. They're trying to increase money supply. They're trying to do things to stimulate business because that helps our economy. So if a company wants to expand, if they have a low cost, to do that? Well, they're more likely to do that. Well, Japan was in the same boat. Now, back in 2016, 
Japan started a program, their YCC program, it's their yield curve adjustment program. And what that did is it said interest rates, well, it's going to be minus 0.1, a negative interest rate up to zero. And they could tolerate up to 25 basis points, a quarter of a percent. Now they came out and said, you know something, we're going to be kind of flexible on that. And uh, we're willing to take interest rates up to 1%. Now, that may not seem like much of a difference. It's gigantic. One, it's a shift in their policy. They're, they're talking more flexibility, which isn't what people expected before. You know, that, it, there's some interesting things here, Jim. You know, the Bank of Japan owns more than half of the Japanese bond market. So when they change interest rates, that's debt that they own that they pay on. So it, 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 there's an economic impact to them. I think the other thing that gets lost in the shuffle when we hear this kind of discussion in Japan are the regional banks. There are some estimates that if the long-term interest rates increase by 1%, the economic value of some regional banks could drop by 60% because they hold a lot of debt, uh, government securities. So as you know, as as interest rates go up, the value of those securities go down. And that's where they could have an issue there. So it, it's really, um, it's going to have potentially dramatic impact. So we are seeing a change in attitude. And, you know, no, Jim, but, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, well, I just want to get my head around the negative percent, right? The negative yeah. 0.1%. And basically, are they saying, hey, we'll hold your money for you, but we're going to charge you for it? Well, they do, but they don't really. And if you look at it, well, look, here, here's the reflection of that. Let's talk about the, the consumer in Japan. The, the residents of that country, uh, they don't really invest in the marketplace like we would expect. They have more financial assets there than they do debt, uh, actually about $8 trillion worth. So that also changes the attitude of people who live there, how they hold their assets and where they hold them. So Putting money in a bank isn't giving you much of a return at all. In fact, nada. What, so would would the Bank of Japan as an entity then also own ETFs and other oh, types of instruments? Oh, that is an excellent point, Jim. That's an <laughs> excellent point because they own more ETFs, which if people aren't familiar with them, they're a security, trade like a stock, they own more ETFs than any fund in Japan. So they own armloads of ETFs. Now, let's talk about why they do that. One of the feelings they have is if they make equity purchases in their stock market, it can increase the sense of security for the other people of Japan. Look at the the central bank is doing something in that market. Well, maybe maybe it's okay. Uh, so there is a, a logic behind them doing it, but yes, they do participate in a big way in that regard. So you mentioned yield curve control. And that seems there seems to be some focus on the 10-year uh, Japanese debt instrument as kind of a, a cornerstone or a keystone for that. How, how, how is that more important than others? Uh, well, I don't think it's more important. It's, you know, the 10-year note for many countries, that's one, the longest duration they'll issue. You know, we have 30-year bonds. Not every country had 30-year bonds. You know, that that's kind of a U.S. kind of thing. So 10-year is really... I, I would say the global benchmark that a lot of people look at, where is the 10 year right now? Um, so that's part of that. Uh, and when it comes to their tolerance 
for the yield on that now that they're willing to make a change from 2016 it was kind of cast in bronze that that changes a lot of other things it 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 says something about where where they're willing to go that we wouldn't be talking about this just two weeks ago or a week ago. So on the but the te- so on the ten year side, those yields you could compare them to other central banks in the world. Um, but when we look at the short term interest rates, it seems like uh, with the they've maintained lower rates, zero percent rates, even through this crisis that every other country seems to be going through. Is there a fundamental reason, or is it just a different opinion on how to handle things? The latter. It's their approach. It's part of that YCC program you're talking about. They held, they held the uh, crown. They felt okay. Look, and maybe part of it is that they thought it could be transitory, which we heard in our country. You know, when the supplies become available, we'll be okay. We're not going to have inflation. Well, we can see it continued, be- because what happens when we start to see some inflation? Well, people say. Doggone it, you know, this inflation's chewing away my salary, my wages, so I need more money. And so companies say, all right, I'll give you more money. And what do they do? Now, their cost goes up and they got to protect their shareholders. So they increase their prices, which adds to inflation. So we have that cycle that starts. Japan was thinking, hmm. Let's just keep interest rates low. Let's let's provide that stimulus. The, the thing about it is with their consistency from 2016 till now, I, I, I would have expected more explosive growth out of Japan. And we haven't really seen that rise to the expectation. And I think you know, the BOJ hasn't either. Uh, not that their economy is doing terrible. It's not. And the probability of a recession, I think, is very low uh, for Japan. But it, it's, it is a change. And so it, it, the, there's a little right. difference, though, in how wages are set, right? There's, when you compare the two countries. So th- their labor gets, there's a different process there, right? It, Exactly. It's more transparent there than it is here. You know, here it's kind of a negotiation kind of thing. There, it's very transparent what people will be paid, how much of an increase. And, you know, Jim, what's interesting there is that we are seeing now an increase in wages that's um, more aggressive. It, we're seeing changes in in, uh, interest rates and wages that we haven't seen before. So it's being recognized. Their wages actually were low when you look at many of the positions there. They've increased that. The other thing that they've done is they have more women uh, employed. They They have tried to accommodate a woman that wants to take care of the home and wants to take care of a career. They've been more amenable to that. They've also changed something, and that's immigration. You know, Japan's got an issue where they have higher death rates than they do birth rates. So their population is shrinking. And they recognize that. For the last 10 years, it's been like that. So what are they doing about that? Their immigration policy is changing. And by the 2070, they want to have 10% non-Japanese immigrants in their country. That's a big shift for that country. And, you know, that issue isn't unique to Japan. Look at China. Look at Singapore. Look at South Korea, Taiwan. They're all facing this this birth rate, death rate issue. And... Uh, so so Japan, yes, it is a more of a transparent process when it comes to increasing wages. Uh, and they're taking steps to make that, to adjust to that. So I, I think it's really important. And they're doing something about it. 
Yeah. Well, okay. So that's interesting to know. Also, I did not, I did not realize that because you need labor right here. You know, we, you know, it's, we have a, a lot of labor and a lot of it coming in every day from different countries. And, uh, you know, companies need that labor to help build stuff. So I could see the same problem. Uh, it sounds like even manifesting itself more over there. Yes. There, and it's because of their society, just the way it's been structured and the, and the way it works there. Not good or bad, uh, but it's a recognition of a change that they need to make. And I think that's the big deal. And they're doing something about it. So why this and I'm, this whole discussion is important to me because of the currency pairs that we that that we trade, right? And um, if 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 I could, if you don't mind, I'm going to show a chart really quick and ask you a couple of questions. I'm just going to show you a weekly. If you could see it on your screen, okay, let me know. Um, a weekly, uh, sorry about my notes. A candle chart for the yen U.S. cross, which is the currency pair traded at the at the CME group. And one of the things, my first question is this, on this chart, we have a rough double bottom forming here from October of last year till pretty much now. Is there a line in the sand where uh, the Bank of Japan says, that's that's enough of that, we're gonna intervene? Oh, yes, yes, that, that you're right on, or at least I believe you're right on target. Uh, and the reason for that, Jim, is, in fact, if you go back to my daily videos just a week or so ago when we were down at that level, you get near 70, uh, that's typically where that equivalent is equivalent to about 145 yen to the dollar. And that is where the central bank has a tendency to say, you know, something, this is getting a little too weak. Because this, you know, we think about currencies, we, in talking about trading, you know, Jim, we should also talk about the carry trade. Because what we just heard last week, it's going to have an impact there, potentially. And if people aren't familiar with the carry trade, money managers, forex traders do what you and I do when we look at interest rates at banks. You know, if you and I were looking at a bank that says, I'll pay you a quarter of a percent. And Another one says, I'll pay you 4%. Well, where are we going to put our money? Where the 4% is? Well, money managers, people I've dealt with in Canada and Europe and other countries, do the same thing. Only it's a little different in that we could use Japan as an example. Let's say that you and I could go there, and it's related to the chart that you have here. Let's say you and I could go to Japan and borrow yen for 90 days at a quarter of a percent. Now, we take that yen, this loan, and we go to Australia. And Australia pays, let's say, 3% on a, a deposit. Nothing fancy, a deposit at a bank. Okay, so we take that loan from Japan. We go, we convert it to Australian dollars, and we put it in the bank. And that's at 3%. We paid a quarter of a percent. We're making two and three quarters percent, and we're doing nothing, just moving this money around. We're just taking advantage of the interest rate differential between these countries. But here's the tricky bit. Let me just finish this one part, Jim, and that okay. is... Uh, when you go to get that, so 90 days pass, right? We made our interest in Australia. We're going to take Aussie dollars, convert it to Japanese yen, and go back and pay our loan off. But if Australian dollar has gotten very weak against Japanese yen, we may not get enough yen to pay off our loan, which would be a bummer. What happens, though? Now, what these managers do, and it goes right back to this chart, is they hedge. Just like you and I could do. If we we're going to take a trip and we want to hedge our currency exposure, we could do that. So these money managers don't just do this transaction. They protect themselves against that exchange rate differential potential. 
So they had you. Yeah, so that was going to be my question. You have to once you have to unwind the carry trade at some point, and when you unwind it, there's things you got to consider, like the currency, the cr- currency cross between those two countries. Exactly. Yeah, it to- to- makes 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 total sense here. Let it, it, let me just real quickly throw out, you know, the forex markets, the over the counter markets. They quote the yen differently, right? They they do the it's it's the inverse of the futures market. That's right. What they do is they do yen per dollar. You know, they're doing dollar yen, actually. So when you have a cross rate or or an exchange rate, as you know, there's two variables, right? Like euro, U.S. dollar. And we call it the euro, right? Well, it's always that first variable in terms of the second variable. So when we look at a rate for the euro, it's the the dollar value of one euro in dollars. In the cash market, they quote Japanese yen uh, in the number of euros per dollar. So it's the same thing; it's just an inverse of it. Yeah. So it, and it's and, and it's a question that we get a lot of times. So it's like, hey, the yen's at one forty four. What's with all these decimal points? <laughs> And, yeah. you know, my joke is, well, because futures traders are more advanced and they can handle more decimals. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I don't know if that's so, true, but I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We'll poke fun at those guys a little bit. Um, so going forward, though, I, I think the Bank of Japan's pretty much on a five, six, seven week schedule for when they have their their they reevaluate and do their monetary policy. Um and without asking you to forecast, I'm going to ask you to forecast. What's the outlook going forward here uh, for the Bank of Japan? Oh, I think they're going to stick to the new rhythm that they've set, the new script. Um, they, you know, they do have to deal with inflation, just like we are here. And it would not be a typical Japanese way to approach that to say one thing and then do something else and do something else and constantly change it. I got a feeling they're going to be living with this for a while because they need to see changes. Has this increase, has it not damaged anything, but has it slowed things down? And as you and I talked about, it takes a while to really measure that. So between now and their next meeting, they're not going to have an answer. So I'd be amazed if they would make any changes in that regard. So this isn't a case where um, the Bank of Japan is just acting later than other banks, and we're gonna they're going to end up with a 5% policy rate after a whole series of hikes over a long period of time. That's not going to happen. I'd be very surprised. I, I, it's not the mode we've seen from then since 1990. So I, yeah, I, I don't, I wouldn't expect that at all. And boy, if it did, you know, think about the ramifications. It would be tremendous within the country, within those regional banks that we talked about on the global scene. And, you know, part of that chart that you're showing us where we saw the volatility when they made that announcement, it's also the unwrapping of, of carry trades because it creates uncertainty mm-hmm. and that's why you saw so much volatility people said holy toledo i had 90 days but I- i'm going to do it now because they're not sure and it's calmed down a bit as well but you are right sorry we are approaching a level that pay attention to that that 70 is a big deal you're you're right on yeah. target jim so, but now, so now my bias has changed a little bit after after listening uh, to your insight, and that in my mind, the suggestion that we could have an equal and opposite rally in the yen doesn't seem it seems remote because of the idea that you know they're not chasing rate. Correct. So therefore, we're at a level where we've seen buyers come in before for support. But is there is there an economic reason to see a huge rally in yen right now? I'd say no. I agree with you. Therefore, 
a sideways move here, I think, makes more sense as the market tries to digest what's going on. Right now, nobody really knows. We, we Because of what you said, your observations, are they going to change it? Are they going to do something different? My God, they've actually made a change. So there is uncertainty out there. Uh, but I don't look for this to fall out of bed from here, nor do I look for a big rally. Sideways, I think, makes more sense. It, it makes more sense to me now, too. Dan, I, you know, we're up against time. Um, I've learned so much in this last 30 minutes. I greatly appreciate your insights uh, today. And I knew I knew you would you would know you would know more about the young than anybody else I'd possibly be able to talk to. So, uh, again, thank you for your time today. Appreciate you being on the show. Oh, my pleasure, Jim. Always good to be with you. Hopefully we'll have you here uh, soon in the near future. Um, in the meantime, to. everybody. Thank you, Dan. In, in the meantime, everybody, uh, remember, most important message of the day, please be safe out there, be good to each other. Thanks for coming.